Malachi chapter number 1 to get you all on the same page chapter number 1 of the book of Malachi is written to the priest of Israel now the priest were responsible not only for maintaining the house of God they were responsible for taking the sacrifices that people brought judging them whether they met the standard then performing the sacrifice then they were also responsible for not just maintaining the house of God opening it, closing it making sure that everything was structurally sound they were also charged with the performance of duties inside of the house of God the burning of incense making sure that there was an offering on the table of showbread they were the high priest we know once a year was responsible for offering up the sacrifice that was responsible for pushing back the sins of all Israel for a year but that wasn't the only kind of sacrifice there were sacrifices of many kinds go study the book of Leviticus I mean, in Deuteronomy also talks about it in some of the practices. But there were many different... There was a sacrifice for praise. There was a sacrifice for uh, supplication. There was a sacrifice for purification. There was sacrifices for many things. But chapter number one of the book of Malachi, written to the Levites, the priests, those that were trained up and knew what God expected. See, we can go all the way back, way back yonder, to where Moses led Israel out of Egypt God said that the firstborn of every Israelite by right was God's and he said but instead of every firstborn that God would select the Levites as the tribe that would be his priest and that the Levites would serve in the role of priest for all of Israel See, before that, every family, whoever the patriarch was, was responsible for being the priest for the family. We can go back to the days of the patriarchs, and we can look at Jacob and Esau, for instance. When it said that Esau sold his birthright, that wasn't just talking about the double portion that he got, because he was entrusted not just with everything that he already had now he had to take care of the father's estate he had to take care of his mother he had to take care of the other wives of his father right that's what the double portion was it wasn't just how I'm first I get twice as much it's because he had a whole lot more responsibility that came along with being the firstborn and so when Esau sold his birthright he didn't just give up the double portion he also gave up the right to be the spiritual leader of the family which is why early on in this chapter it says that God said that he hated Esau, but he loved Jacob. God did not hate Esau because of Esau being born first or because, you know, he was a wilderness man or any other reason. God hated Esau because Esau hated God. Esau made himself the enemy of God. Everything that God said in the time of the patriarchs was responsible for a leader of a family. Esau shucked it, said he wanted nothing to do with it. He turned his back on God long before God said, you're my enemy. And God said that he was his enemy because Esau made him his enemy. Okay, keep all that in mind. So when we get down to verse number 7, talking to the priest, God says, ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame or sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person? Say it the Lord of hosts. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This has been by your means. Will he regard your person? Say it the Lord of hosts. He's talking to the Levite who were instructed, trained up, and knew what was acceptable in the eyes of God and what was unacceptable. Some person, lay person in Israel, may not necessarily know all of the laws. Okay, to this day, that's why we have judges. It's their job to know the laws and to apply them correctly. And then we've got appeals courts that you can go to and say, hey, I think that judge was wrong. And then we can go all the way up to the Supreme Court of the U.S. All of that is saying, I want somebody that knows it better. Right, I want somebody to take another look at this 
And because of our Constitution, we have that right. Okay, well, in this day, a lay person may come in with an offering or with a sacrifice, and the Levites were supposed to inspect it. They were supposed to say, does it meet the criteria that God set forth? If not, they were supposed to reject it, inform that person on what God would accept so that they can go out and find a sacrifice that would be meat to be offered up unto God, that would be proper. Okay, they were knowledgeable, and it was their job to be leaders of Israel. Now, some people twisted that, perverted it, and then by the time Jesus' day comes along, you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes that they liked being in a position of power. They liked telling Israel what to do, but they didn't like submitting to God's authority. That was by no accident or change. That started all the way back here in Malachi. Okay, God's saying, you know what's right, and still you do the wrong thing. Before this, he says, y'all are worried about what you're going to get out of doing what's right in the eyes of God. He says, y'all won't even open or close the doors of the house of God without asking to be compensated for it. Right? Let alone when it comes to offering up sacrifice. They thought that they deserved more than what God was giving them. So they decided that they were going to offer up unto God what was acceptable in their eyes rather than what God instructed was proper and what was supposed to be offered. Okay, so verse number 7 says, You offer polluted bread upon mine altar. But what's polluted bread? Could be bread that was made wrong, that had the right ingredients. Okay, every year around Passover we hear about, usually we hear about Israel and the people preparing it. If you are a by the book right, practicer of Judaism, you're supposed to have two kitchens in your house. One kitchen is only supposed to be used during the week of Passover because it's not to be defiled, the instruments, the oven, and everything else in it. Not supposed to be defiled by the food that you eat all year long. That's just meant for making food that meets God's prescribed under the Old Testament law meets God's expectations for what you're supposed to eat during the Passover. They're so serious about doing what God says, they put a whole second kitchen in the house just to avoid the possibility of something else that they ate earlier in the year defiling the food that they're going to eat during the Passover feast. That, that's how serious today some people take it. That, well, that's how serious they were supposed to be in this day. It's how serious God expects you to be today. Right? They're still living under the law. They don't realize that God, through His Son, fulfilled the law, set us free. We're no longer under a schoolmaster. We're under grace. Hallelujah. But if they truly believe what God said, there's a whole lot of them thinking that they're going to be part of that 144,000. I don't like them odds. I'll just take Jesus. Okay, but when it says polluted bread, polluted bread could have been made the wrong way with the wrong ingredients, could have had yeast in it. Okay, we know about unleavened bread. Right? It's supposed to be bitter. It's supposed to be unraised. Right? Could be one of those situations. Could be that it was polluted because they made it and then let it sit too long and it got a little moldy. Okay, could have become defiled because along the way, Right, little chipmunk scurried up into the pack, took a bite out of it. It's not whole anymore. It's defiled. It's polluted. When it comes to that word polluted, it's not necessarily talking about the offering itself. It's talking about your treatment, your safeguarding of that offering. Okay, under the Old Testament economy, if you were offering up a burnt sacrifice unto God, they say that the person offering the sacrifice would have a staff with an instrument on each end. Okay, they would have a rake or a meat hook on one side, and then on the other side they would have some sort of contraption to scare away birds. Because if a vulture, if a crow, if anything landed on top of that meat while it was being burned, it would have defiled the whole thing. You'd have had to take it off of the altar, 
You'd have had to start over. Well, what was that meat hook for? I don't know if y'all have ever cooked steak on a grill. Now imagine doing that on a stone altar that may not be perfectly level. And when those greases, when that juice out of that meat starts coming to the surface, that thing starts sliding. Grills nowadays are grills so that grease can fall through it and the meat stays where it's at. It's not slip sliding around. Okay, if that offering falls off of the altar, hits the ground, it's defiled. It's no good anymore. It's polluted. What started off as something that was acceptable over time became unacceptable because you didn't safeguard it. That's what that word polluted means. But why did the ingredients go wrong? Because you weren't attentive to the recipe. Okay, you knew what was expected, but you didn't follow the instructions. That has nothing to do with the ingredients. That has to do with you and your attentiveness to it. Okay, it's a true story. They're not here, so I'll tell it today. I don't remember, well, I remember the aftermath, but I don't remember the events of this day dad was out of town preaching revival and my mom tells me I have no reason to disbelieve her but tells me that she walks into the room and I was glued to the TV and she said hey I have to take this phone call We've, I've been waiting on this phone call all day okay the water's filling up in the bathtub for Christian and Sydney go in there and shut the water off for you know when it fills up okay I did not do that I was glued to the TV and I thought that 30 seconds had passed by and it had been much longer than that. And next thing I know, mom is screaming and she claims she ran into the bathroom as water's flowing down the steps to the lower floor and into registers and into the heater and everything else. Christian's splashing around saying, look mommy, I made big bath. So I blame him. He said he made the big bath. It's his fault. Okay, Sydney was so small that like her nose was just sticking out above the water. I kind of feel bad about that one, but she, she all right. <laughs> what do you say? Wasn't anything wrong with the water. The water was doing what the water was supposed to do. Wasn't anything wrong with Christian or Sydney. These kids, they didn't know better. Christian thought that he was making a pool inside of the house. He was having himself a fun time. But Sid was just trying to keep her head above water. <laughs> Couldn't do that, so she, sat, she went with her nose instead. Okay? What are you saying? Was it the bathtub's fault? No. Was it Christian Sidney's fault? No. Was it the water's fault? No. It was my fault. Because I wasn't attentive. I allowed my attention, which to this day, you put me down in front of a TV, I'm liable to get sucked into it. Especially if what's on TV is entertaining. But the same was true with the priests. They're saying you're letting things slide in that shouldn't be slid in. You're following the instructions, but you're not doing everything in a timely manner, and it's going sour. Okay, well, then he goes on to say, verse number 8, you offer the blind for sacrifices. This is not evil. God had the standard. You know what God's standard was for sacrifices and offerings? The first fruits. The best. Amen. Right? That entails faith. I'm giving up my best to God because one, he deserves it. Amen. Two, he's the only reason I have any of it. Amen. But three, by faith, I believe that if I give God my best, that he'll meet all of my needs. He's promised to do so. Did he not say... Bring your first fruits into the storehouse Amen. and see if he wouldn't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you. He's promised to do so. But yet at this point, faith had waxed weak. And the people were bringing things unto the priest and the priest was saying, I don't want to have to deal with this guy coming back later. I'd rather do it now than do it in four hours when I'm tired and you know, we're going to have to rush it and we're going to have to you know, do everything. Let's just go, go ahead and bring it on in. Knowing that it didn't meet the criteria. See, the first one was because of their attentiveness. This is because of their standards. Their standards had been shifted from what God expected to what was convenient. 
Right? The sickly animal don't take as long to burn on top of the offering because there's not enough meat or not as much meat on it. Right? The one that is lame may be easier to slay. It's not going to kick you. Right? It's not going to fight you. It's not going to watch what you just did to all the other animals. Right? And then go down without a fight. It's lame. It can't defend itself. It's blind. It's easy to lead to slaughter when it doesn't know what's going on around it. it may have blemishes. It may have spots. All right, yeah, we'll take it. Whatever. If that's your best, we'll take it. It wasn't a matter of best. God said he wasn't going to accept those things. Then in Jesus' day, you get to the point where people weren't even bringing their own offerings. You had people that were in the house of God setting up shop with different animals and different materials. That could have been, like you said, bread. Could have been incense, whatever it was. They're offering it for sale. You don't have to deal with inspecting it. You don't have to deal with setting it aside from the rest of the herd and watching it for a while. Make sure it's not sick. We can certify all that. All it takes is a little bit of money. The only problem is, is that they were being disobedient to God. But how much did God hate it? Well, after Jesus sat down and thought about it for a little bit while he was making a three-quarter whip, he drove them out in righteous indignation. Why? Because it was a mockery of the house of God. There was no sacrifice in that. There was no time invested into that. I was just show up here, take my money, and take care of all my problems. That's no better than what the Catholic Church does nowadays. There was a time in history where the Catholic Church sold these things called indulgences, which was if you give us enough money, we'll forgive whoever sins. We don't care. Just give us money and it'll be acceptable. We promise we'll take care of everything with God for you. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? It took out all personal responsibility because they let their standards, standards move. Their goal of what was acceptable was brought so low that God sent a man to them to say, hey, this guy stop. If it doesn't stop, that, something bad's coming. What happened? They got conquered again by this place called Rome, eventually. Back to verse number 9. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? He's saying, you haven't cared about him. Why would God care about you and the calamity that's coming your way? He said, beseech God, beg God. Rinse your clothes, put yourself in sackcloth, get on your face, prostrate before God, and beg God to be merciful, to be gracious, to spare you what you do deserve, because it is by your means. Now, where are you going with this, Brother Jordan? Glad you asked. These were the priests. These were the people that knew better. These were the people that spent time in the house of God, that were raised around the house of God. These were people that were entrusted with, quote-unquote, the secret thing, so that all could be partakers of God's blessings. Okay, now I understand this is Old Testament economy. But nowadays... Who do you think the church is? Does not Revelation say that he made us kings and priests? He said that he made you a priest so that you could enter boldly into the throne room of grace right before the very throne of God and pray directly to God that you didn't have to have a mediator. But see, being a priest isn't just about praying to God. Being a priest is assuming the responsibilities of of things that go on around the house of God. Is it any wonder that he said that we're a body, fitly framed together, Christ being the head? What's a body supposed to do? Move. Do things. Well, why did he make you a priest? So that you could get involved around the things of God. There's nobody that God ever saved that God said, nope, you're not good enough to do anything for me around the house of God. 
Priests were the ones that were responsible for delivering readings of the Word of God. When they'd go to the temple, as Jesus, every Saturday on the Sabbath day, guess where you find Jesus? In the temple. Guess what he's doing? He's reading, preaching, teaching the Word of God. Why do you think they called him rabbi so often? It means teacher, master. He went into the learned folks at 12 and stupefied them. Amen. Every time he opened his mouth, they're like, that guy knows about God. You know what the sad thing is? The priest of their day and age didn't do that. It was supposed to be that when you went to the... Somebody that knew about God was supposed to get up and tell you about God, about what God expects, about how you can find favor in the eyes of God. How it is that you need to conduct your life in order to receive blessings and to receive grace and mercy from God. You can't earn it, but he does say that if you do certain things, you will be blessed. Go read the Beatitudes out of Matthew chapter number 5. Those are promises. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but those promises will not pass away. But we're priests in the present day church. Just as the priests then were supposed to go out and tell people what God accepts. What it takes in order to come to God. We got a whole lot simpler job. You don't have to know some 600 laws by heart. You don't have to know all the customs. And you don't have to know how to slay an animal and offer up a burnt sacrifice. All you've got to know is Jesus. But yet in their day, what they had been entrusted with had been defiled. And then their standards had gotten so low that what they were doing, this is a dog and pony show, and God's saying, I don't accept it. But we've got a pastor and so many preachers that come through here. How many times have you heard it said that America hadn't seen revival true revival in over a hundred years you know what that tells me that what people have been doing God's not satisfied with it it's not acceptable to them I truly believe God wants to send revival but people keep God from sending a revival in this passage it says you offer polluted bread upon his table literally under the scriptures that was meant to be a place in God's house that if God chose to show up and manifest himself that there would be a meal for him he's saying you're supposed to treat that as if I walked into the house of God I could have a meal and you got some moldy bread over there that's been about half eaten by a possum Right? The sacrifices that you offer up unto me, they're blind, they're poor, they're lame, they're sick. They're the worst of the worst. He said, go offer that to your governor. Which also is a subtle reminder that in God's economy, there was no governor. There was God as the king of Israel. Then they wanted a king, so God gave them a king. And guess what kings are apt to do? Be manly. Not manly as in buff, I mean full of self. Full of the flesh. Amen. And guess what came as a result of that? Captivity. God's saying, you want to know why you even have a governor in the first place? Because long ago, people started saying God will accept that when God wouldn't accept it. He's saying, you're in the shape that you're in right now and it's getting ready to happen again because y'all haven't learned the lesson. So with the Lord's help, we're going to talk about why revival hadn't come. Now, Brother Moore, this may be reductive, maybe flawed logic. I think it makes sense. But if true revival hadn't come in over a hundred years, it would stand to reason that everything that anybody in this room has ever seen in their life doesn't meet God's expectations. Because if it did, revival would have come by now. But Brother Jordan, are you saying that preaching the Word of God's right? No. They had all the right tools. 
they were still at this point okay, in Israel and God told us Solomon's temple was gone by this point but they still had the house of God that they went and they rebuilt after they you know we know the story that they went and they built the city man had a weapon in one hand and a tool on the other they was rebuilding the walls did something miraculous that only God could have allowed to happen they rebuilt a whole city wall in a fraction they can't even get road work done nowadays in five months okay them suckers built a wall in just a couple of days wild enemies were out there trying to kill them how'd they do that the grace of God but they still have all of the instruments that God said you know, when they retook the city the king told them take all of the instruments that used to be in the house of God take them back all the vases all the pots all the you know the bowls everything that you need take it back why because one man was faithful to God and found favor in the eyes of their ruler of the day it was the king's cupbearer one person had the right mindset but all of Israel didn't why? Because if they did, Malachi wouldn't have had been written. They were doing it right. Why would God send them a message saying, you're doing it wrong? But if coming in and coming out, you know, blowing out every week, the throwing your tithe in the offering plate, if shouting on the songs that you like and then staying quiet on the songs that you don't know, shouting at the beginning of the message because you're all excited because Brother Doug gets up here and hacks and you kind of get into the energy but then when he starts hitting on things that you oh I don't know about that then it gets dead quiet people been doing that for decades guess what ain't working you know what God says it's polluted it's lame it's sickly it's not what God expected you know what God expected when, he, when we come to the house of God? Unreserved, pouring out your best unto God in worship. Long before a priest could ever offer up an offering, guess what he had to do? Purify himself. Amen. He was consecrated unto God, but he, that means reserved for God's use by the fact that he was born as a Levite. But he had to sanctify himself. That means make himself ready for God's use you're bought with the price your life is not your own God's got an ownership seal stamped in the very gable into your soul saying I bought him you're consecrated unto God but too many are not sanctified what's that mean you remove everything that God's not pleased with in your life so that God can use you as he intended to use you sanctification not pr popular nowadays you know why? Because that hits where people live. You know why legalist churches are popular? Because they get a list from the preacher every week of what they need to do. As long as they do that list, that means they're right with God. Show me chapter and verse on that. I show you're supposed to do all things as unto Christ. That's not a list. That's a lifestyle. And then on the other end, the real liberal churches, they're popular because you got no rules. You can do whatever you want to. You saved on your way to heaven? Nothing you can do to lose it. Might as well live like the world while you're in it. And we claim that we know the truth, but yet we're no better than they are. You know what the world looks at when they see what we bring into the house of God? They see the lame. They see the sick. They see us saying that we're bringing our best in, but they look at it and they say, that dog should have been put down a long time ago. That's not their best. God says, offer it up to, under your governor. But take that down to Andy Bershear and say, hey, I brought you a dog and it's got ticks and lime and you know it's got rabies and all rib cage skin on its bones. You think he's going to say, thanks. He's going to say, no, take that thing down and shoot it. Old yeller, that sucker. Put it out of its misery. Right, if your very own governor wouldn't accept what you're bringing into the house of God, how much more so is God going to reject it? The world has standards. Right, wrong, or indifferent. Even the heathen knows that you're supposed to give your best to people that have authority over you. Been a while since I've been there, but the last time I was in a courthouse for a trial, guess what? Everybody was in their what used to be Sunday best. 
Nowadays, people blow in and blow out, and you got more denim than a 70s rock concert. But he's saying, Brother Jordan, if that's your best, by all means, wear it. Make sure it's clean. If it's got holes, patch them up. Right? Because I don't want to see underneath. That's why they invented clothes. Adam and Eve didn't like their nakedness. That's why they made themselves clothes out of fig leaves. I don't like yours anymore than I like mine. I don't want to see it. But the standard. Well, so and so does it this way. I don't care. That's between them and God. Right. Sanctification is personal. That's not universal. Amen. You've got to choose to be sanctified. Amen. But here's the thing. I can't figure out what God wants you to do. That's your responsibility. Why do you think he made you a priest so that you could enter into the throne room of God? We like quoting the verse, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. But he also made you a priest so that he could directly talk to you and say, this is what I expect out of you. Amen. And it's not a shifting goldstone. It's been the same since the beginning. Amen. His standard is Christ. If he wouldn't accept defiled bread onto a table that was meant to be where he would come down and commune with Israel in his house. How much more do you think that he won't accept our person when we blow in and blow out? You may have the right garments on, but that, he stands at the door and knocks. Wants to open so that he may sup with us. Just because you open the door and invite him in doesn't mean you've got the attitude, the personality that's going to make them want to stick around. You've got to be amenable to company. If you like me, you don't like people. Right? I like alone time. I recharge my batteries alone. Being around people wears me out. Okay, I can do it for a little bit, but then I'm zapped. Guess where I'm going? I'm going back down in the back cave. I'll be back out when the inner, you know, when the batteries are recharged again. Other people, they recharge their batteries being around other people. But I believe that's what they call extroverted and introverted. But regardless, God knows each and every one of you. When God tells me to be around people, I'm around people. And if God told me to do it and I humbly Except to do it, knowing that I don't like fear. Guess what? Usually I have a real good time. Because what the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, one. But two, there's enjoyment. Right? When he shows up, I'm, it's not about having fellowship with people. It's about having fellowship with him. But when I go and do something in the flesh, even though it may be something that I want to do, if I leave the Holy Ghost out of it, I guarantee you it's going to be the most miserable experience I've ever had. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? What I'm saying is that the expectation of being sanctified, not just reserved for God's use, fit for God's use. If people were sanctified, revival would have come a long time ago. It's not about the tools. Tools have not been changed. The tools were given to us by God. It's about how you're using the tools. The priests in their day and age, they had no inspection system. They weren't using the tools that God gave them. It don't take much to use your eyes. It doesn't take much to use your ears. It takes a whole lot of effort sometimes to not say something but it doesn't take too much effort to say the right thing. It doesn't take too much effort to be obedient. But you know why people don't do it? Because they like this thing called humility and pride wells up in them. The only reason you won't be sanctified is because you want to be something other than what God wants you to be. Because if you wanted to be what God wants you to be, you'd be it. Not on Brother Jordan's authority, on the Bible's authority. Man cannot serve two masters, or love one, hate the other. But in addition to that, out of the abundance of the heart, man speaketh. You know what your speech says? Who you really love. 
You don't know the way that you dress, the way that you behave yourself really says. It shows who you're honoring and who you respect, who you love in your life. You know why the world talks to everybody like they hate them? Because they don't love each other. They love themselves. And it's going to wax worse and worse the sooner we see the day coming. But see, sanctification is what has been missing. If you get sanctified, you're going to serve right, you're going to witness right, you're going to worship right, you're going to live right before God. But why aren't people sanctified? Well, it's because people don't love God. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Jesus said that he did everything that he did because he loved the Father and he wanted to be obedient to the Father. A true Christian does what they do not because it's what they want to do but because they've fallen in love with the Father. They see that what the Father wants is better than what they could ever dream of and they trust that the Father knows better than they know. So they just do what the Father says because they love the Father. We said it last week, rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Why? Because to rebel against God means that you love everything that God isn't. It's the same as saying that God isn't who he said he is, that the Bible's not true, that Jesus wasn't the Christ. It's just as awful as that. Because to know to do good and to do it not, it is sin. To not be sanctified, to not love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, according to the Bible, it's sin. But people don't care. They don't get convicted about it. They don't even entertain... I mean, we read it last week. That for someone who has left the way, the chastisement is grievous unto them. That rebuke, being told that they're wrong, is awful. They run and they try to fall into the darkest hole that they can to try and get away from God. Why? Because they love something else more than they love God. Where are you getting, Brother Jordan? I don't know if you've seen. This world's going crazy. Yeah. Amen. Right, people are saying, well, Israel's called all that war on Hamas. They've been at war for thousands of years. The only difference is, is that for a while they got so angry about where they were at and what they were stuck with that they weren't angry at each other. Now one of them did terror attack and the other one said alright I'm going to wipe you off the face of the map I can respect that but some people are saying is this the end times no because we don't have a one world government yet shut up read the bible you'll be alright although I did hear a funny joke I'll end, I'll end class with that speaking about the end times but you know why people aren't sanctified? Because of unrepentant sin in their life. The sin of what? Not loving God the way that they should. Yeah. Amen. Why is it unrepentant? Because they're not sorry about it. Because they think that they can love God a little bit and love what they want to love a whole lot and still be right with God. Amen. That's not God's standard. Amen. You know what God wants from you? Your unreserved best. Sure. What's your best? I don't know what your best is. I know what my best is. You know what your best is. That's what God expects. But Brother Jordan, I may not be able to live up to that. It's all right. You're robed in the righteousness of Christ. If you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. If you're focused on being sanctified, and that's all that you desire because you love the Lord, you're not going to stay in whatever mud puddle you step in. You're going to get it made right. You're going to get cleaned up. You've got to purify yourself. Why? So that you meet for the Master's use. Amen. This world needs revival. Sure. Your family needs revival. You need revival. Because if it was enough, what we were already doing, the world wouldn't look the way that it looks. God told them, 
You keep doing the same thing over and over and over, and you keep ending up in the same spot with somebody else calling the shots in your life, with you being in captivity, and without being free to live as God intended you to live. He says, but instead of realizing that the system's broke, you just keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. He said, you wouldn't even do under your governor what you do to me. You wouldn't even, do, and by governor, they mean that's the guy that they hate. They don't want him in charge. They're under captivity. He said, you wouldn't even give the person that you hate and that you don't want to be in charge the stuff that you give me. How many give their boss more than they give God? How many give their family better than what they give God? Well, Brother Jordan, aren't we supposed to be great fathers, great mothers, great siblings? Yeah. But if any man love father and mother more than me, any man love son and daughter more than me, not worthy of me is what Christ said. God didn't love your family with an everlasting He loved you with an everlasting love. He bought you. He didn't buy your family. He bought you personally. You know what that means? He expects personally from you for you to love him most. Because he loved you more than anybody else. Amen. How many people's lives are dictated because of what's going on in their kids' lives? I remember when parents used to reinforce the sentiment of the Bible that what's best is do what God said. I don't care what you want to do. You're going to submit to what God says is best. That's why I do what I do. You should do the same. But now, no. God forbid one of them throw a temper tantrum and everybody drop everything they're doing and go over and coddle them. You know what happened if I threw a temper tantrum in the middle of Kroger? My parents would not leave the shopping cart and take me out and take me home because I didn't want to be at the grocery store. I'd have got whooped and then I'd have to sit there in pain and being angry and not wanting to be at the grocery store, still at the grocery store. You know what they taught me? It don't matter what you want. There's some things you got to do. We don't go to the grocery store. We ain't got food. We're not farmers. We're fosters. But stuff doesn't just magically appear in the cabinet when you want food. You got to go get it. You got to pay for it. Well, how do you have money to pay for it? Because you went out and you worked a job. And you gave, you gave the boss man everything you had, not because you love your job more than God, but because you do all things as unto Christ. And while you're there, you try to live a life and show a testimony of someone that loves Christ. Be an ambassador for him. You know what those used to be called? Standards. Why don't people do it anymore? Because people's standards have slipped. What they think is sanctified in God's eyes is unrighteous. It's filthy rags. You know what he accepts? His son. Do you know how to be sanctified in God's eyes? Get so close to Christ that God can't see the difference between you. Amen. You say, that's not possible, Brother Jordan. Hogwash. He told you to be holy as he was holy. Why would he tell you to do something that you couldn't do? Because that means he would have made it to where you would always be a sinner and never able to perform it. But God didn't say, thou shalt not lie because you can't stop lying. You can control your tongue. He told you not to lie because lying's wrong. And he knew that you could keep yourself from lying. You could fulfill the law, but not in this sin cursed flesh. Adam and Eve were perfect, and they still sinned. It took Christ to redeem you. But after you've been redeemed, he said that if you'd follow him, he'd take you down this way called straight. It's narrow. It's got a long way to go. But he said if you'd go day by day with him, every day he'd make you more into the image of himself. And that you'd find favor in the eyes of the Father. Why? Because he's robed you in his righteousness. Everything that you've ever done up to this point ain't working. We gotta get back to the old paths. Gotta get back to what God said will work. 
Because having a week of revival services or having a camp meeting, going and hearing so-and-so preach, it ain't cutting it. But why do people keep doing it? Because they love it. They love having rather than giving. You know what it takes to be sanctified? You've got to give everything you've got to God. Put it in His hand and never want it back. Amen. People, say folk, don't like that. You know why? Because it takes a whole lot of faith. And so many of us have so little faith. It takes a whole lot of faith to get, take everything that you've got, everything that you desire, everything that you could aspire for, everything that God's blessed you, and put it back in His hand and say, God, I'm appreciative for it. I'll hang on to it as long as you let me keep it. But it's yours. It's not mine. And then to not do it momentarily, continuously. What's missing? Sanctification. Sanctification's missing because love is missing. Now, I can't tell you why people don't love God the way they should. He's only loved you better than anybody ever could. He's only given everything more than heaven, earth, and everything that we can see in order to provide for you what you could not attain on your own. That I can't tell you. But this I can. If you draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. Whether you love him or not, he loves you, but when you love him back, he can manifest that love in your life. And you can feel it. It's more than just words on a page. It'll be day in, day out, in the gable end of your soul, doing backflips and somersaults and cartwheels and everything else. Because really all that matters is that he has you and you have him. But somewhere along the line, people stopped being satisfied with God and they wanted other stuff on top of it. What happened? They got their eyes off on a distant country and they fell in love with something and their heart waxed colder and colder on God until where? Until they was down in the hog pen in the far country. But they gave away everything that the Father had ever given Why? Because they love something else more than God. What's America today? We're in a hog pen. Eating the slop of the pigs. Why? Because we took everything that we had and instead of sanctifying it towards God, we gave it away to become more and more like the world until what happened? The world had its way with us. Amen. What we've been trying ain't working. So why don't you just do what God said from the beginning? Because in the end, it'll be enough. Not just enough for God's approval, but it'll be enough to satisfy you, to sustain you. And in one of these days, it'll be enough before the judgment seat of Christ. Right. And you'll hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. But you look around at the world, it's apt to start thinking like the world, start to act start it, apt to start acting like the world talking like the world we need to keep our eyes set on heavenly places that's why the Levites were they were set aside they were supposed to spend all their time at the house of God why? so that they would have the mind of God for God's people thanks to listeners like you IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel if you haven't already subscribe today and as always thanks for listening